Hi, this is Dr. Corey Glenn, and I want to share a case of doing a rehabilitation of an edentulous maxilla, uh, and we'll be doing the planning and the surgery in this presentation. The way to approach these cases is that you first need to have a treatment denture. Now, this denture needs to satisfy all the aesthetic and functional requirements of the patient. The teeth need to be in the ideal position, so if the patient doesn't have a denture, uh, currently that satisfies those, you do need to start by first making a denture that satisfi satisfies those requirements. Once you have that, you need to create a radiographic denture duplicate of the treatment denture. What I'll do is then reline the duplicate denture in the patient's mouth with PVS because we do want to try to get the very closest tissue fit that we can possibly have. And once you've done that, you need to place um, some radiographic markers. Now, I use the Dental Mark radiographic markers, which are available uh, from the Blue Sky Bio website. Um, I try to place seven or eight of these evenly spaced around the denture surface because these are going to be used as our stitching points once we uh, go to the software. Place the denture back into the patient's mouth and make sure that it's fully seated. You'll notice in the top picture, I've got the patient biting on some cotton rolls. This is going to ensure that there's a complete seating of that denture all the way around. And then we're going to take a comb beam CT of that uh, patient. Once you've taken the comb beam, you can take the denture out of the mouth and then proceed to pour up a stone model inside of it. Now, very important, when you do this stone model, you need to make sure that you include a generous land area of stone outside of the denture. And once it's set, go ahead and create some dimples or blebs on the, the surface of that uh, land area, again, because these are going to be used as stitching points. Once that model sets, now we need to optically image this. Now, I send this to a lab for this part. Uh, but the instructions are for the lab to image this entire denture surface as well as the land area. And once they've done that, to separate the model and do another scan, optical scan, and give me an STL of the tissue surface as well as the land area. In the end, what we end up with is three surfaces which we need to merge. We have the comb beam CT surface, we have the STL uh, surface of the denture, and then we've also got an STL surface of the gingiva. Now the reason we've done these specific markers and, and points this way is because as you can see in the upper left, we have stitching points uh, between the cone beam and the denture STL by using those little radiographic dots that were placed on the denture. Um, so we can get that model stitched properly, but then we need a bridge to be able to get the, the soft tissue STL merged to that one. And so that's where we use the land area markers. Those land area markers are going to be the exact same in both the denture and in the gingiva STL, so you can stitch them together properly. So now it's time to integrate all the data that we've got. So we need to get our three surfaces integrated together. This is the cone beam surface. As you can see, when we open the patient's DICOM, it's got the denture surface as well as her maxilla. And we can see all of the radiographic markers very clearly that we've placed onto the denture. And what we need to integrate first is the STL model of the patient's denture. So we'll tell it to align. And it's going to bring up the stitching window. And this should be a very simple stitch because these radiographic beads show up very easily. So you just go about placing dots on all the radiographic markers. We're picking the common points between the two sets of data here to allow us to stitch them well. And you can appreciate as well by having these little small radiographic markers uh, leaves no room for error as far as where the point is. It's very specific. It's going to be difficult to get off and, and create an errant point. So we've got seven points picked once we click OK. We should see now that this model is integrated very well with the comb beam data. If we come back to our surfaces panel and turn on the hint, you can verify the accuracy of the stitch by going through this scan. So what I'm looking for is to make sure that this blue line is following exactly along with the radiographic denture. 
Now, some people have asked me, why can't I just do this technique with the patient's existing denture? And to be honest, you can do that, and it does make it a little simpler. What you'll have difficulty with, though, is verifying the stitch because it won't show up well on the comb beam, sc uh, the comb beam scan, and so you won't be able to tell very easily if this blue line is following the patient's denture. But as you can see here, it's following very closely. You'll notice these areas where it doesn't. That's actually the PVS reline, so I'm not concerned about that. Um, very good stitch there. We'll check it also in this window. And once again, we do see that it's corresponding with the outline of the denture in all the different views. So great stitch there. At this point, we need to turn off the 3D rendering. And we need to now stitch this model to the gingival model. Come back to model manipulation. And at this time, you're going to align to model. And so... So we'll actually want to align the gingival model to the blue model. And the stitching window will come up again. And so remember we created the little dimples in the, the land area of the cast. The reason we did that is because it makes for very simple stitching points between the two. Now we've created all the stitching points. We can click OK. And now we can see the stitch that results. We have these two models meshed together very accurately. Again, you always confirm the accuracy of it. So what we should see in this one is that the uh, outlines of the, the land areas align perfectly. And then we should also see that green line, which is the, the tissue, uh, following closely inside of the denture. And again, there won't be a perfectly flush fit because we have PVS on this side. We have soft tissue right here overlying the bone. But again, you can see that the land area is perfectly aligned. There's absolutely no error whatsoever on that because we've made those great stitching points. And so this looks excellent. Uh, again, if you look in this view, you can see the tissue surface follows very nicely inside of that. So all of our models are merged at this point, and this is a tremendous value to have this because we can see uh, the 3D rendering, we can see the bone, we can see where the tissue, or I'm sorry, where the tooth emergence is so that we can plant our implants from a prosthetic position. If we turn off that view, we can see the soft tissue and know exactly where we're emerging from soft tissue. So it's amazing what we've accomplished in just those few stitches. Now with all of our data merged, at this point it's time to start placing the implants. Now I've already done that in this case just to save time for the video. Uh, but I will say a few words as far as how to go about planning these. Uh, so first thing you need to think about is what's your final prosthetic plan? Do you intend to do traditional crown and bridge? Uh, do you intend to splint everything together or would you like to do individual bridges? Uh, so for example, I've done cases in the past where we did three individual bridges to restore the upper arch. I love doing them that way, but to do that, obviously you've got to have a minimum of six implants so that you can do uh, maybe number 7 through 10 on two implants as a bridge, and then from canine to first molar on the others. Um, so you need to take those things into consideration. Are you going to do a hybrid? Well, if you're doing a hybrid, you may only need four implants. You might could do a traditional all-on-four approach. Um, if you like to, to have 
more titanium in there in case one fails. That's kind of the approach I've taken here. You can see in this window where I've placed the implants and they're somewhat evenly spaced across the premaxilla, uh, staying out of the sinus as the sinus does dip down back here. So let's go one by one and just look at the implant positions. And you can't really separate your positioning of the implants from where they're going to emerge prosthetically. So how do we evaluate where they're going to emerge prosthetically? Well, you can add abutments onto all of these. And so in this case, we could say replace abutment. We could choose a custom abutment. And I like to make the length 20 millimeters long because this helps me visualize the emergence. Turn that on. And as you'll see, we can evaluate where the emergence profile will be on this case or on this implant. Again, I've already done those for all of them. And one of the things you'll notice as I go to the next implant right here is that I actually have these angled. And so one of the considerations you may have to think about is are you going to put a straight abutment on there or are you going to do some angle correction? In this case, because the anterior implants needed to be somewhat flared, uh, the plan is to use 17 degree angled multi-unit abutments. And so again, if you come in and choose replace abutment, you can just go to custom and choose the angle of 17 degrees. Again, I make it 20 millimeters long just to visualize where it emerges. But in doing that, we can ex see exactly where these are going to emerge from a prosthetic position. Now this implant, um, what I opted to do is split the difference. I do intend to flare these teeth just a tiny bit with the final prosthesis. So um, this is shown with a, a straight abutment, but if we brought it to a 17 degree, it emerges about right here. And so that implant was positioned where it could accommodate either one. And as you can see, it's positioned in bone. It's perfectly splitting the difference between the cortical plates of the palate and the buckle. Our first implant is going to be just into the sinus barely. And so our drill will probably perforate the sinus there just a hair, uh, but likely not damage the membrane. Once again, as we move forward, we're staying within bone. We're trying to keep a millimeter and a half to two millimeters of buccal bone around all of these implants. And we get to our final one. And once again, we're uh, staying within bone everywhere. Now, the other thing you'll notice is the depth of my implant placement. How did I come to this depth? Well, for, for starters, we needed to go a little bit deeper to have an adequate crest to put these in. So as you can see up here, uh, the crest is somewhat sharp and we're going to not have the bone on the buckle or on the palatal if we try to split into that. But the other consideration and the bigger reason why I've placed these deeper is because of the space needed for our prosthesis. And so as I turned on the ruler there, you can see I'm measuring from the platform of my implant up to where it's going to emerge out of the prosthetic um, restoration. And so I have 11 millimeters here. I really want to try to keep that at a minimum of 10 um, to keep room for adequate strength in the, the restoration uh, to make sure we're not going to have thin spots throughout it. And so on all of these, that's how I arrived at the depth of placement for them. So now we've positioned all five implants. We've uh, got them in a prosthetic emergence that is going to work for us. I did opt to place some pins here. Um, so these are placed just like an implant. You can come up here and click add implant. Uh, but rather than an implant, you're going to actually choose a pin. And as you can see right here, you could choose that. I've already done these, so that's not necessary. And you can see the three pins are positioned uh, in between implants where they're not going to interfere with drills if we have to use them. And those will function just like uh, the other guided positions. We'll take a drill through the guide tube, uh, create the osteotomy to the depth that you're seeing right here, and then the, t the pin will slide in right behind that and it'll stabilize the guide. Truthfully, I didn't think I would need those, but I would rather have them and not need them than to have not planned them and, and then we have to abort the procedure. Once the implants have been ideally positioned, it's time to go ahead and make the guide. So first thing I'll do is come up here and turn off the denture surface because now that we've planned them to the prosthetic position, we don't really need to see that anymore. We're going to be building the guide directly onto this denture or onto the gingival surface. 
We also need to turn on the guide tubes and we can turn off abutments at this point and enlarge this model because everything we'll be doing from here out is on this model. So you can see we've got the green uh, depth stops built into the guide, the rings are in position, none of them are impinging on tissue, so now we need to come to guide panel, lock the implants. Now one of the things the software is going to default to is going to be to remove the undercuts. In this case we want to make sure we uncheck that. Um, we know that that denture is seated in the mouth so in a toothborne case we really have to worry about undercuts because it's not going to seat over hard tissue without it. Soft tissue cases you don't really have to worry about that and the, the undercuts actually add to the retentive nature of the guide. So we don't want to remove undercuts in this case. So we're ready to draw the curve and what I like to do is just to actually come back here for a moment and let's turn all the guide tubes off as well as all the implants off uh, just because it makes for a cleaner surface to work on. We'll very quickly draw the extent of the guide. It doesn't have to be perfect. We'll have a chance to modify that. Edit curve and now we can drag these around and get them to the depth of the vestibule. You want to try and go as deep in the vestibule as you possibly can. Once you've defined the extent of the guide, you do need to turn back on the guide tubes and now you can push create guide. So here's the resulting guide that the software has given us. If we go up to the surfaces panel and turn off the model, we can spin this around and we can see that this is exactly like the internal of that uh, impression that I did inside of the denture earlier. This is the exact same surface, so if the denture fit very accurately in the mouth, if it didn't have a lot of wiggle in it, you can anticipate that this guide is going to have the exact same fit because it's made on the exact same surface. Uh, it, sh it should fit exactly the same. And so again, I don't anticipate that I'll need these guide pins, but you've got them there just in case. And finally, we can come up to the parts panel and we can actually look at all the parts that we need to conduct this case. If you don't have the drills, these are all the different drills that will be needed, what tubes we'll need to uh, put the metal cylinders in right here, um, which implants that we're going to be using, and the pins. It's all there for you and you can actually click add to, par uh, add to cart and it'll take you to the Blue Sky website. And you can check out and get whatever that you need. All that's left at this point is to go and export the guide, so we'll do export data. And the only thing we want checked is this surgical guide. You would just check it, click export, and that will save on wherever you tell it to save. You upload that for 3D printing, or if you have your own printer, you can print that out right then, and you're ready to do the surgery. So let's go do the surgery at this point.